Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and today I'm going to do a liquid acrylic demonstration. Um, we're going to be painting a pen and ink drawing that I did uh, earlier uh, called Queen Bee. It's a visual pun, and we're going to be using Schmincke Aero Color. Now, this is a liquid acrylic. It has pigment in it. Um, it's normally used for airbrushing. I use it um, as a watercolor, as a basic watercolor. And I've got all the tools out here so you can see what we're using. We're using turquoise, number 506, yellow, uh, 220, scarlet red, 330, and um, um, umber, 620. And there are 28. There's a 28 in front of each of these because that says it has pigment. It's not, they also have a version of their arrow color that um, is not as pigmented in it, but this is pigmented so that it has more permanence to it and it's not dye based. So this is what um, I normally call liquid acrylic. You want to take the bottle first and shake it up real hard because the, you can see, um, you will be able to see there's um, pigment that lies in the side and bottom, so you want to really shake up your bottles really well, agitate them before you use them. And like I said, I'm using only four colors on this piece to keep it nice and simple. Um, and after you shake up your bottle, um, this is the type of palette I use. Um, by the way, this is the arsenal of brushes. I just pulled out a variety of brushes that I figured I'd need um, while I'm doing this piece. This is probably the one I'm going to use the most. This is my um, Zero uh, Windsor Newton. It's an old brush. You can tell the, the fibers are not as 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 nice as they would be as if um, it wasn't an old brush. If I'm using Windsor Newton brushes, and they're actually quite a couple of Series 7s that I'm going to be using today, they're old brushes. I don't like to use, if I can help it, any of my really good watercolor brushes with liquid acrylics because they will beat up your brush. Um, this one is a synthetic and um, I believe this one, the Raleigh is a synthetic. These two are synthetics. Um, their bristles are designed more for this type of work uh, and they can handle the brush better. But as you can see, what happens with the, the, um, the acrylic brushes is that after time, the fibers start bending at the tips. And whereas with your natural brushes, even though they get um, battered and what have you, they will always keep a point. So if you can afford the natural sable brushes, always go with the natural sable. I'm also going to have um, um, a uh, um, knife blade for accidents and also a, um, a latex eraser. And one other thing, because I realized I didn't have it out here. My good old kneaded eraser. These, these two are my major erasers. Um, this is a chunk off a latex eraser. You know, I, I usually try not to use a full big latex eraser just because they're a pain in the butt to keep around. And I use kneaded eraser as your standard silly putty type eraser. But at the present, I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to load up my palette so you can see what you do. Um, I rarely. Ah, of course, my. Mm, there we go. You, you want to keep your, the, the um, Schmenka colors will last for frickin' ever as long as you keep the bottle closed. And I'm going to put about five drops of each color in my palette. Let's see. Now the yellow I'm using is, it's straight yellow. Um, it's still to, this is a yellow that is more to the gold side rather than the blue side. The red I'm using is basically, it's called Scarlet Red. It's a red to the yellow side, again, and not to the blue side. So like um, a crimson would be a red that's more to the blue side, or um, Rose Matter would be more to the blue side, whereas Scarlet is more to the yellow side. And the blue I'm using is a turquoise blue, which means it's more to the yellow side. So everything that I'm using actually is kind of the yellow side today. I'm, I'm sticking to the warm side of things. And we're going to be using umber, which again is a warm brown. 
it's it's um, actually it, it's a brown that is again more yellow and browns can be mixed um, by combining your red yellow and blue together but it's always easier to use a, a regular brown now now that I've put about five drops of those in there I'm taking an eyedropper full this is a regular just eyedropper and I'm putting a whole eyedropper full of water in each one of those colors to dilute them because you don't want to use the liquid acrylic straight out of the bottle because it's it'll be too heavy you'll just find it too heavy you can, you can if you want to but um, like with all things experiment if it works for you it works for you when I'm painting I always have a paper towel in my left hand I'm right-handed so I always have a paper towel in my left hand when I'm painting and um, water nearby and I, I I just use this you can see it in the uh, picture here this is just a big gigantic coffee cup is what I'm using for my water container um, so what I'm going to start with is on this one I'm going to um, probably start with a little bit of the shadowing so I'm going to start with the umber and what I'm doing here here is I'm taking drops of the, uh, the paint mixing it up so it's, it's mixing it up with what it, it had with the uh, water and I'm putting it into um, another pocket to use as the palette so these are these are basically your your color wells and I'm taking water from my um, cup putting it in here and then mixing so getting it even a little thinner so I can feel get a feel for how thick the color is in the palette and I'm gonna um, start putting in shadows these are gonna be my shadow areas so I'm gonna use the umber as my my shadow and I'm gonna fill in the shadow areas first because this is this is we're using a, a transparent medium so think about if you were using uh, watercolor or standard watercolor or marker except this comes down permanent once you you lay down your washes they're pretty much there as they dry you can go wet into wet but for the most part once this stuff dries think of it like marker where you can't really um, pull around the color after the fact you can layer the color but what you're putting down is is it works more like a, a permanent type of situation so you want to try to keep um, you go from light to dark and you think about um, everything's going to be transparent so these colors are going to be laying under each other and when you put another color on top of it it's not going to change the shape of the color that you've laid down very much and what that does make for is it does make some permanence it's kind of scary um, because whatever you do um, if you make a mistake it's like oh shist I can't change this mistake it's done and there it is um, there are some ways always that you can fix mistakes the one thing that I have learned as a painter of transparent mediums or painter period is that there's no such thing as a mistake that you if it's a bad mistake there's usually some way you can f find to fix it and also here's the other thing to always remember what you see as a mistake most likely the viewer is never gonna know it's there um, if you think it's you really will make if you're making a major mistake it's like okay fine the paintings done throw it away um, and you got to get used to doing that occasionally um, part of the problem of learning is that you're gonna make mistakes and sometimes there's gonna be that piece that you just don't keep and 
being willing to throw out your mistakes. Sometimes keep your mistakes too. You know, you want to look back and say, okay, what did I do wrong? And was that really that wrong? Because sometimes what you think is a, I have some of my pieces that I really don't like are some of the pieces that other people absolutely love. I have a couple of works that I have sold prints of that keep selling all the time because they strike a chord emotionally or mentally with somebody where there's something in that piece that just hits home. And I didn't know that I was going to hit, you know, you hit a home run and you don't even know you've hit it. And that's the way it is with some works of art. You just can't help but Okay. This one worked. I don't know why it did, but it did. Okay. Now I'm going to go into putting in some shadow on queen bee. And again, um, this process here is actually going to be pretty fast. So I'll, I'll be interested to see what I believe this video. I'm going to tell you right now, we're just starting it, but I think this video probably will take me no more than 45 minutes at the top to do this. One of the things that liquid acrylics is besides being a very interesting and pretty medium, I, I find it very, I, I like liquid acrylic. It, it works on a lot, a lot of levels is, um, it's fast. It's, um, I don't, um, dawdle as much with it as watercolor. Watercolor, you can take time and build up and build up and build up because liquid acrylic is actually very intense and, and dark for the most part. Um, you have to thin it way down to be light, which, and which you can, I mean, you can get that kind of, of a, uh, of effects with liquid acrylic. Um, the brush I'm using right now, just changing the subject for a moment. I'm using a number two. This is a number two Windsor Newton series seven, um, killer brush. If you're going to be doing inking, any kind of inking or painting, um, and, or you've never purchased a Windsor Newton series seven and it's expensive. Um, I've got to check online how much these are nowadays. I haven't bought a series seven in a while. Um, <laughs> buy them on sale. They usually run probably anywhere from 20 to 50 bucks. Um, I gotta check what they are right now, but I'm, I'm suspecting they're around probably 20 at Dick Blick. Um, depending on where you go for the brush. If you're going to your local art supply store where they, they have to mark up quite a bit because they're a brick and mortar and they've got to pay bills, um, you'll most likely pay anywhere from 35 to 40 bucks. I'm usually for a number two series seven brush. They are pricey. They've always been pricey, but you want to know something. Once you've painted with a series seven, you won't go back. It's really tough to, you know, I keep trying other brushes. I keep on trying to, okay, maybe this one will be fine because it's, you know, it comes from Russia. Oh, no, not as good as a series seven. I don't know what Windsor Newson does. Um, but they, I've been using series seven brushes, um, since I first started probably college. Um, the first brushes I really got were Grumbachers, which were really nice. Uh, my first uh, watercolor brush was a Grumbacher number no. three that lasted forever. I beat up that brush. I am just cruel and inhuman to my brushes. I beat them up. And that brush was my go-to brush for years and years and years and years until I finally beat it to death. And I got it at a hobby store. Um, when I grew up, I lived in Mason, Arizona. We didn't have many art supply stores near us. And um, I, my mom was a silversmith and um, she could get all her silversmithing supplies at that hobby store. Um, it was a pretty good hobby store. I got my first book on how to draw. With my own allowance, I paid 99 cents for a Walter T. Foster um, how to animate book how to draw cartoons. And it was, um, oh dang, I'm forgetting his name right now. Oh, it's terrible. Real famous 
um, Disney animator did the Walter T. Bo Foster book on animation and was my first um, drawing book in animation. Oh, that I can't remember that right now is really bugging me. My apologies. I will get back to you then on my next video. I will make sure I will let you know what his name was, but it was definitely Walter T. Foster used to make, and you can still get them usually at like, um, Michael's. You can still get Walter T. Foster as a publisher still in existence. And, um, the, the book on animation that, that he, that uh, was produced is still, you can still find, but it was how I learned how to draw. And I used to go to my local public library and check out books in drawing. And uh, I knew at the time all the Dewey Decimal numbers I would go straight to. I knew exactly where all the books on drawing were in the library. And uh, I would go there every weekend and on my bicycle. My poor, my bike rack. I had, I had a book rack in the front of my, my Schwinn Hollywood bicycle. And I would load it up with books on how to draw and how to cartoon. Um, and that's really how I learned to draw between the, my, my first book that I bought at uh, the hobby store and all the books that I would check out of the library. Okay, so we're just about done with all of our, our burnt umber here. And you'll notice how fast this stuff dries. It evaporates beautifully fast. Okay. Now, the bumblebee, or she's a, she's a honeybee, I'm sorry. She's a, our queen bee is a honeybee, and let's see. All of her colors are kind of orangey and browns, and she's got um, a dark black eye. Let's see here. Maybe I'll start with the roses first. Bee roses. Bee roses. Um, background. Mm, let's do the background. It's like. So I'm going, okay, where do you start with this thing? Now that we've put in all our shadows, I'm going to start with the background. I'm just going to get, get the, the background um, a little light here and first, and it's like this blue is just way too heavy. I got to, I'm going to take it over here. I got to put a lot of water in it. And then I'm going to take all this that I put and I'm going to put in another cup. Like I said, this stuff is very very concentrated. So the color is very intense. So if you want to get a light color, you have to thin it down quite a bit. And I'm going to give her some blue in that background. And I'm going to keep the, the background pretty modeled. One of the things that you can do um, to keep, if you're worried about a wash um, looking foxed or being too consistent. One of the things I've always done that works out for me. And again, when you start painting with this type of watercolor, you can figure out your own technique and your own, um, ways of using it. I, one of my favorite techniques you can tell this is called wet on dry. My paper is dry. The watercolor is wet. So I'm, I'm applying the, the, uh, paint, just directly wet onto the dry paper. And you can tell, like I said, I watered that, that uh, paint way down. And you can see how intense the color still is. And that is arrow color. That is the, the particular paint is, like I said, it's a very intense color. So um, don't be afraid to put extra water into it. And you'll, you'll get used to it as you play with it. And that's what I would really suggest when you do or use a medium for the first time, um, do a piece that you're not worried about it being precious. Do something that, that you are making to be just a game or something fun so that if you screw up or you do something wrong, you don't feel like, oh my God, I put so much work into that piece and I use this new medium and now the painting that I wanted to be really fantastic has all screwed up. I mean, always, if, if you're using a new medium, spend just a little time. I mean, this, this piece, like I said, it's going to probably be no more than 45 minutes to get it done. Um, 
don't waste your time on something that you might have to throw away and then that way if it becomes a masterpiece when you're done hallelujah but if you need it to be something that doesn't quite work out and I'm gonna I'm gonna right now I'm gonna go right into those leaves rather than um, because the leaves I'm gonna get my green by doing um, an overlay of uh, blue and yellow so right now now mind you that's a bud there but I want the the bud to kind of blend in a little bit to the background actually I think I'll do that with this one too um, I'm so I'm going over them with the blue so that'll pull them back into the background immediately and you'll have a mix of background and foreground elements because you've added that underground or it's underground that's fine you've get that background layer of color on top of the piece itself and what I'm doing here with this the stippling you can see that that when the the paint dries there's again this is pigmented paint it's transparent but it's got some pigment in it so the little puddles that I'm I'm doppling down here they will dry in varying degrees of value it won't be one flat value of blue some areas will be a little bit darker some areas will be a little bit lighter and that again it's it's a quality of the paint that you're using and that's part of the fun with liquid acrylic and the thing is is that when you think about it when you're you're working with watercolor again you're making little puddles of color before you start too so it's not that different working with the liquid acrylic than it is with working with watercolor um, if you're used to working with wet on dry or even wet on wet wet on wet with liquid acrylic also has um, some interesting properties and uh, what's really fun is adding salt I was going to do it this time and I didn't I forgot but whenever um, I will do a demonstration maybe next time around with what you can do by adding salt into your uh, painting and what salt will do with uh, some of the chemicals you're using it, you get some really fun textures and colors by adding uh, salt to what you're doing and that's always a fun thing to do okay so we've got our first layer of blue down here background is the thing is is that this is just kind of the first um, layer of my background I'm probably going to go back in a bit and add some yellow and red into the background to get some harmonizing going on later too okay so we got the we've got our, our blue background now I'm going to paint in our roses just get them out of the way so I, I know what I want to do with my and we're using like I said with this I'm just going straight over let's get big area and this is the the brush that I'm using now is a um, De La Rowley Merit M85 size 7 so it's, it's a size 7 watercolor brush um, when I go to a store I often I just I look at the the, the tip of the brush and and um, the size it is and going okay I need one about that size and uh, this this is a um, acrylic bristle brush now I'm letting you'll notice I'm letting a little bit of um, the water it didn't dry in the background here and there's a little bit of foxing where the the paint is is going out and it's a little bit more exaggerated than I want so I'm going to dab that a bit but um, that's perfectly fine that's I don't consider that an axe it is an accident but it's not an unwanted one um, a lot about um, when you're painting in watercolor is allowing the good accidents to happen and that was okay that looks good I like that I'm so I want a little bit of um, integration a little bit of that that water feel I'm working with a water medium and I want it to feel a little bit of that um, unintentional uh, 
drift. Okay, so... Like I said, I'm just... With this um, paint, too, it's, you can tell when you get it thin, it goes a little bit to the blue side, actually. And that's the fun thing of the, the liquid acrylic, too. It does do some of its own mixing, and as you thin it out, um, the color will drift in, in um, hue as well as value just a bit. And again, with all watercolor medium, um, when you're working with different colors, I still haven't begun to explore um, what various uh, watercolors will do. Um, different makers, there's Raphael, there's, again, Winsor Newton's probably my favorite. Um, there's numerable, really high quality watercolor paints out there, and they're different. The, uh, a CAD red with Winsor Newton and a CAD red with um, uh, Rembrandt will be two entirely different CADs just because each maker has its own formula. And if you like one maker over another, that's absolutely wonderful. I'm not that picky. Um, and I've, I've never had that much cash. You know, it's one of these things, too, where watercolor paint's kind of expensive. Actually, all paint's all expensive, and I've always been a bit of a pauper. So I've always stuck to kind of a limited palette. And so I keep it to usually a warm and a cool version of whatever color I get. Okay, now I'm going to let those colors dry a little bit before I go into them again. And I'm going to start working on our B-girl here. Let's see here. And her, her body is um, a little bit of an orange color. Now that's too orange. So, let's see here. You can't see that. It's not on camera. So this, this is the red I've put over here, and I've put, taken a little bit yellow and brought it in there. So I'm pulling this, uh, this orange over here, a bit of that orange over here, and then I'm going to take, I grab up, you can tell I like scoop up, I'm scooping up, there's yellow, there's just yellow on that brush, and I'm dumping it into this puddle pan. Now that, that color is a bit too thick, so I'm taking scoops of, that's just water, that I'm dropping into the color pan to get, you can see that I'm getting a yellow orange there. And that's a nice yellow orange. Now I'm gonna take a little bit of that. I'm gonna pull that over to another color pan. I'm gonna take another scoop of the yellow, a couple more scoops of the yellow. There, now I've got a nice yellow orange. This is a nice yellow orange or it's an orangey yellow actually. Here's This is the yellow orange and that's the orange yellow and then I've got a nice orange right here. And I think what I need too is I need a yellow brown. And that's a really dark brown right there. So I'm going to take several scoops of yellow into that brown. And that's umber by the way. The, the brown that I'm using is umber. There, and I'm making it a more yellow brown. And I'm going to clean off my brush, scooping up a couple more drops of yellow into that, throwing some more water in. There. And that'll give me that'll give me a nice golden brown. Okay, and the, I'm going to play with those colors on my B and I've got I've got a nice orange right here. here as I'm trying to think I think I'm going to use yeah I'm going to use this brown this yellow brown for her beehive her beehive hairdo she's got a beehive and of course I'm using a southern accent to do that my apologies to southerners I don't know I mean my mom used to she had a um a fake beehive in the 60s that she would wear when she would go out to fancy um, dress dinners, that she'd um, use a uh, 
um, headband. Uh, she she sews some. My mom was a great seamstress, and she would sew beautiful, beautiful dresses, Butterwick fashions. I mean, that was the big thing in the '60s. And and my father was an engineer for GM, and they would go to these fancy get-togethers for General Motors, and um, she would wear this fake beehive hairdo that was really pretty. I mean, it, it, it was just all the fashion, you know, the high beehive fair do. So it's like, since we're doing a queen bee here, I figured she just, you know, queen bee would have to have like a blonde beehive hair do. Or a honey blonde. And then the bee's body's got it's got um, dark brown on the back. I use a little bit more of the, the umber. There we go. legs. There we go. But anyways, as we go on here, it's like we've got doing a mixing between oranges and browns in the legs. Now what should we do with about the comb? I think we need in the honeycomb, we're gonna keep it pretty yellow. Because um, the honeycombs, it's, the, the wax itself, are pretty yellow. So we're going to, I'm going to spot them with the yellow orange first in each of those circles. So she's got this honeycomb cape. That's looking pretty good. Did all those circles. So you can see when, when you do honeycomb, they're basically concentric circles. They're hex, hexagonal, uh, but the honeycomb is basically made up of circled chambers. And because of the, the wax fills in around the circle, they end up being hexagrams. Hex meaning six, six sides. But they're actually little circular cells where they they lay all the eggs. Okay, that looks good. And I'm going to, I need to let that dry in these areas here, the areas that have dried there. I'm gonna go back with a little bit of blue because they've got transparent wings. So I'm gonna, I forgot to fill in the blue in between the spaces of her wings. And when you're doing watercolor, for me, I, I have a tendency to, to jump all around the piece because you've got to let the various areas dry. And so like I said, I've just, these areas where I put those really big blobs of um, orange are going to have to sit there until the water evaporates out of them. And because they're primarily more water than paint, it's going to take a little bit for those to evaporate. So I'm going to go back and do the leaves on our 
rose here. I'm going to take the turquoise and the yellow and bra ta da turquoise and yellow behold lo and behold you mix turquoise and yellow together and you get green and what I might do there we go go throw a little yellow green in there a little more turquoise in that one so you want there so that I um, get a variety of color in my green it's like I'll start here's the yellow green at one point of the leaf and then add some blue green into it and then what let it mix on its own in the water on the leaf and that way you'll get a variety of color into the leaf let's see a little bit more yellow I am okay. Okay, what I just did, I I smeared a couple of my um, little uh, uh, cavities there by uh, putting my palette down on it, and uh, which will happen. <laughs> I will do stupid things like stick my hand into the paint. That'll happen. Um. There are all kinds of ways accidents occur. Um, my my favorite is when you're painting and the cat decides it wants some of the paint water. My cat, in particular, really likes paint water. I don't know why. Thank goodness, all of the uh, the paints that I use are non toxic, and uh, supposedly, according to uh, all the health regulations, all the paints I use are non toxic. Now, if they really aren't, well. My cat's been living, she's, she's 15 years old now, so it's like, I'm assuming that the paints that I've been using are non-toxic because my cat's not dead yet. And it's like, I can't stop her. I'm really bad about leaving my, you know, okay, I finished the watercolor. I left the, the paint water out, and cat's decided to use it for her drinking bowl. And my cat's actually rather good about that. So, uh... Unfortunately, or fortunately, Smudge has enjoyed using my paint water for many years as her drinking water. But again, the one way I know they're non-toxic is because cat's not dead. Now, again, this the greens that I'm using, and this is why I really love one of the reasons why I really love the arrow color is I'm mixing turquoise and yellow together and getting these beautiful intense greens. A lot of times when you mix watercolors together and you you mix a blue and green together, you get very muddy greens. And the greens I get with um, liquid acrylic are just delightfully um, pure. And it's nice to get some of these really intense pure colors. Now, what I'm doing is, is I'm stippling some green in here in the background just to um, add some interest and harmony into the piece. I'm probably going to throw, because if I just had the green leaves themselves, that would be kind of stark. Um, so I'm adding just a little bit of green into this background as well. And I'm trying to keep the um, the dots from being like pure, you know, because it, it's it's wet on dry. Um, they'll form the shape of whatever you, you, the brush lays it down. So I kind of scumble my my little dotting here and there. Okay. Now I'm going to try. Um, I'm going to get some darkness into the roses there. I'm going to take some straight red, and I think I'm going to take a little bit of the turquoise blue. I'm going to throw a little bit of the turquoise blue into it, and it'll be a bit of a muddy purple. It won't be um, a, a real true purple, but what it'll do by adding the turquoise uh, blue to the, your red is that you've really darkened it down there and then you get um, a more, excuse me, a darker 
um, red and a purpley red to get more the the um, shadows a little bit deeper. Is that like that's real intense turquoise into the um, the red that I've put there, so that we can pull the flowers back and when you get when you throw in the shadows that'll turn the rose so that it um, goes into shadow more and you get more volume and it'll f feel more three-dimensional and give more interest to your rose because whenever you throw extra color in you you add interest but again we're only using four colors in this entire painting. So this is just, I've thrown some turquoise into my red and I've gotten this um, gray purple by doing that so that I can get a darker color. And I'm going to use the same color for the eyes on the bee because I, I don't have any black and bees have like dark brown black eyes so I'll use this purple and the umber together to get the black in the eyes that I want on the bee. But uh, that's, you know, this is your standard when you're a kid and you're learning to mix colors. You know, you mix red and blue together and you get purple. And the thing is, is that with, with the liquid acrylic, like I said, the, the colors are extremely pure. They're, they're very saturated and um, intense and th they're also extremely transparent even with the pigmented um, types of liquid acrylic that's why they're very nice to use and extremely permanent um, I haven't done a light test on them I should do a light test on them to see if you a light test if you ever want to try a light test on any of your um, your paints you paint a swatch of color and then you cover a strip of the paint or you, and leave one piece of it exposed to sunlight and you uh, set a time like a week or a month and then you move the strip and you can see how um, you can do the experiment for up, you know, as long as you want but you just keep moving the strip so that and and denote on your strip which piece you exposed over a period of time and then you can see how ultraviolet will affect your piece now most artwork is not going to be put in direct sunlight ultraviolet is probably you know basically um, the ultraviolet light that comes from sunlight is probably the most devastating thing that can happen to any paint and most ultraviolet light will, you know, it'll kill colors over time. That's why you basically, if you have a painting um, that you want to display, you don't put it anywhere in your house where there's direct sunlight. And uh, you try, if you can, you can get um, glass for it that is, um, that it works like sun, it, it filters the ultraviolet out. And that will keep, especially you have prints, prints, printing ink. You know, for, you know prints are nice, but um, most printer ink will is light fugitive. Um, that's why I use Epson printing ink because it's pretty good for that. Okay, now our little cells here are not drying fast enough, so I am going to take my paper towel and blot them. And they're not as intense as I would like, but that's okay because I'm going to paint over them anyways. But I'm going to let them dry a little more. And I'm going to take the red and I'm going to paint the back of her her uh, her cape here is red or it's going to be red. And then she's going to have red roses in her crown.
And I'm kind of thinking that, that um, the other pieces would be like pearls. Got a ruby scepter with a pearl at the top or a diamond. And I'm thinking, is that like her crown is like white gold? take yellow and I'm just going to take the yellow and coat this whole inside of her her robe here there we go now it looks more like a honeycomb I'm going to go and nab those eyes. The eyes are, are, are supposed to be dark. Um, on bees, they're, they're dark black or brown. And I'm going to mix, I'm going to mix umber and turquoise. So I'm going to throw the turquoise in here. And I'm going to grab some of that red, throw that in there. And that's giving me a really nice dark color. So this is, this is the turquoise, the umber, and the red all thrown together and this is the color I get. This is nice. It's not quite a black. It's almost looking to me like a Payne's gray for our bee's eyes. So again, here, here we just, I've got four colors on my palette and I'm rocking with uh, getting quite a bit of color out of just those four colors. Now I want to see the smile a bit, so I'm going to add some water here. I'm going to pull this down lighter. And there's a little bit of foxing going on there, so what I'm, I'm scumbling up because what's going to happen is as this dries, I'm going to get a, more foxing in there if I don't go back up with the water. And it's getting a little bit dark down here, so I'm going to pull. I'm using my brush now like a sponge. I, I take the brush and I pull all the liquid out of it, and then when it goes back into the this pan of, of color, you can see how it's working like a sponge itself because I've pulled all the water out of it already. So when it goes into any place that's wet, it pulls it out like a sponge there. And then I'm going to take this eye. It's going to all go dark here. Now I'm thinking that I don't quite like I did her her beak part, the beak part of her body with um that's working. Oh, it didn't work, and then I'm going, eh, no, that's working. Okay. And then I'm going to take um, a little bit of liquid here. The bottom side of the bead, I'm going to get her a little bit more orange. So I'm going to take, yeah, that'll work. No, more golden. There we go. Because it, it want to give that, that honey color on the underside of her. And then what I think I'm going to do is once that dries, I'm going to take that purple color and I'm going to go in and I'm going to give her shadows all in purple. And right now I'm going to give, I want to give all the white spaces. I'm going with a little bit of like light yellow wash and trying to fill in any spaces that I have that are kind of whitish that I've missed with a little bit of a yellow wash.
Okay, then once that gets a little dry, hmm. And I've I've got it's gotten the this piece here. I'm not sure if I like that white. When I get done, I'll try to figure out what I want that color to be. It's like I like the white of the the fur here and fur, and I like the rough, and I like what what's going on in the crown here. And I think I need a little bit more brown in her beehive. So I'm putting a little bit more brown in her beehive. What I think I'm going to do, I want to put a, little, a few dots of red up here in the background. Maybe give it the illusion of, of flowers in the background. I'm going to blot those so that it's more of a hint there. There. So give a hint of, the, of color in the background. And I think what I'm going to do too is I'm going to take a little bit of yellow and I'm going to throw it in onto the rose themselves to give a little bit of warmth in the foreground because the, the roses were a little bit too flat. So I'm going to throw in some. There we go. That really helps. Get some of that yellow orange into the foreground. And then I want to throw a little bit of red into there we go, that helps. And I'm throwing a little bit of red into her. Because what happens is if you get one group of color that's um, just sitting like this was all like totally yellowish, now that I've thrown a little bit of red in there, just a touch, you get part all this red that's come here into her, and I'll throw a little bit of red hints into the um, the wings, and that just harmonizes things. It just brings everything all kind of together. And let me give her, she needs uh, black antennas. So I'm taking this, again, this is made with the turquoise, the red, and the umber. So it's not really black. Like I said, it, it reminds me of Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray is made that way too, with a variety of color. Now what to do with the scepter? Do I turn that scepter green? I'm thinking part of it needs to be green. Let's start with yellow at the bottom. This will be good. Start with the yellow green at the bottom. And then go into a darker green as it comes up to the top. Shadow under here on her eye. Give her some rounding to her eye. There we go. That's better. Now, we need to throw a little bit of shadow on her all around. So I wanna make, I'm gonna take the, that purple that I've been using that's a little bit too dark. And what I'm doing is, is I'm, um, you can see right here, I'm making it a little bit lighter. I'm gonna throw that in here. Let's see here, 
a little bit out of the line there. A little blot, ta-da, problem solved. So when you do go out of the lines or something, that's what your paper tells for us to come in and, and blot. There we go. That's what I needed. When you're using yellow, if you've got yellow in the front, purple makes the best shadow. There we go. Yeah, that's coming better. Oops. Because I want to drop this a little bit more behind. What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up. I, I said I like kind of like the white there, so I've, I've made this. This yellow has has traipsed into there. So when this dries, I'll use my X-Acto knife and I'll clean that up and make make it go totally white. And nobody will ever be able to see the difference. It'll just me that knows that I made a mistake. Most people, I I defy you to find the mistakes that I have fixed on my paintings. Because I'm pretty good at uh, fixing my mistakes so that nobody can really see them. We are just about done here. Put a little bit of a, a core shadow on the beehive. On a beehive hairdo. And I think I'll, I'll go in with a little bit deeper shadow with the uh, the purple again under here in the leaves. So I'm turning the leaves a little bit down by put, throwing a little bit of that dark purple in there. And I forgot a couple of buds, so I got to clean up those buds back there. You have two buds here. And I think that we are just about done uh, on the legs. You know, the funny thing is, is that if you go long enough, you can find, oh, I missed that, or I missed that, oh, I didn't do that. And there's, the, there, when you decide when, when is a painting done, technically, the painting's done when you stop working on it. <laughs> it's like, can you always find, oh, I could have added that, and I could have added that. There's one little thing that I do need to do, though. There's a little bit of sky in between her legs right here that needs, oops, it's going more green. There we go. That's enough. And also I'm th looking at it, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to take a little bit of yellow and I'm just going to stipple it into the background because I'm looking at it and I'm going, you know something? We need a little bit of yellow in the background. And I'm just gonna put a little bit, just just enough, like I said, to, to pull everything together. Give it a honey flavor. It's been a bright, honey, happy flavor. I think we're done and that's my queen bee and this is the demonstration with liquid acrylic I hope you learned something today I hope you enjoyed it and thank you so much for coming to watch my video I really appreciate it again my name is Lynn Hunter L L Y N H U N T E R you can find me on patreon uh, please hit the subscribe button like it and um, that's about it thank you very much again I produce these once a week Come by and see the next one. Bye-bye.